I am the master, and you will obey me. Listen to Dan Hadley on Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, or face the consequences. <laughs> for Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast on the Fandom Podcast Network with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, and your designated driver. Better news is this is a show for everybody, whatever decade or century you started watching, reading or listening along to the timeless adventures of that Time Lord, our hero Doctor Who. We talk about it all on this show, so step into our TARDIS and share this journey here with us on Type 40. Yes, I say... Us, because yes, there is more than one of us, my companion on this edition of the show, the original Hoonatic, of course, and today he's as giddy as a schoolboy who's been run, running around the playground in circles. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you again, Simon Horton. It's nice to be back with you, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm for reasons that will become obvious, I'm transported back to when I was about eight years old today. So, yeah, I'm running around <laughs> the playground as we speak. Oh, God. Have we got a show for you? Oh, have we got a show for you this time? I can't quite believe we got this guy, Simon, because we've got a big interview for people today. A big interview, isn't it? We are not worthy today, Dan. We are not worthy. Um, they, they, you know, they always say, don't meet your heroes. Well, the truth of it is, this is definitely one of my heroes that we are about to meet. Um, he's, he's right up there. So uh, I cannot wait to get into this one. You may well recall last year when we made a big show about the Target books, both of us, you know, we, we spent a good hour, hour and a half, didn't we, sort of loft diving through our, our various paperback books and talking about artwork, which is something we both love. And this guy, he's the Target artist. I'm sure that other Target artists would probably very willingly offer that title and, and, and kneel at his feet. And we got to meet him and you know, that's what it is. It feels like you meet people over these new media forms, be it Zoom or Skype or whatever. We, ju we just met a legend, Simon. It's it's phenomenal to, to, to just think about it, isn't it? As I say, he is an absolute hero. Um, and, and let's not forget, you know, he's a hero for a lot of Doctor Who fans, but he's also he's a renowned, world-renowned artist. Um, it, it isn't just Doctor Who. His Doctor Who work is a tiny amount. Yeah, I forgot quite how much he'd done. I forgot about a lot of the film work, the fact that he was attached to like, a big movie, a big George Lucas, Ron Howard movie, which he talks about a little in this show. Yeah, we, we go into all the questions we hope that, that we hope they're the questions that you would have asked. That's what we've tried to do. That's we, what we, we always try to do on this. Geeky, I think, is the word, Dan. <laughs> And we do know that there are some of you out there who maybe don't know as much about the, about the Target books and maybe don't know so much about Chris Akeleos' work, but we hope that this serves as an introduction too. And you know, even if you can't get hold of the old books, maybe you might want to order, pre-order his new book called Clack, which is out in a couple of weeks' time, I think. But yeah, just to give you a little bit of background, Target Books was the publishing imprint set up in 1973 by Universal Tandem. It was a children's range 
and it became synonymous with Doctor Who over a really quite a short period of time. They got the rights to three older Doctor Who titles originally to launch with as part of a bigger publishing plan which included all sorts of other children's titles, Relected TV and various things. And uh, yeah, it just sort of rolled out really. The Doctor Who books became incredibly popular in a really short period of time. You know, Simon was there <laughs> grabbing them pretty much from day one. I wasn't far behind about four or five years later but yeah that publishing continued pretty much interrupted didn't it for an 18 year period Chris didn't stay on the books for that long sadly but the majority of them were adorned with memorable specially commissioned artwork weren't they Simon it was a, a recipe for success really pioneered by Chris Akaleos well yeah I mean he designed the whole the whole look of those, those books to begin with so, so, so although they, they veered off into different artists as the time went on and some of the, again I you know I love um, a, a lot of the other artists that have worked on the range, but Chris Akileos absolutely set the trend. You know, he 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 was the guy that came up with these original books. And let's not forget, these books sold in phenomenal numbers. They were the biggest seller for the Target imprint. They kept the company going, um, and, and in no small part to to Chris Akileos because of the covers. Because let's be honest, you know, who wouldn't want to buy a book that look that's got a cover like that? But they, they leapt off the shelves because because the covers are just stunning he, he really his work in the doctor who line cannot be underestimated his contribution to the history of doctor who it's it's as important as barry letts as terence dix as J and T as any of them he's up there i believe so i think you yeah, know he brightened up many uh, many a saturday afternoon waiting for the show itself to kick off we can't wait for you to hear this. We're not going to keep you waiting too much longer. But if this is your first Type 40, it's only fair to let you know that if you fancy doing some sort of audio time travelling of your own, each and every edition of our show, past, present and future, is up on the Fandom Podcast Network's master feed at fpnet.podbean.com or you can search for the Fandom Podcast Network on the Podbean app. FPNet. Find us and play us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play or iHeartRadio. Let us know what you think of all that. There are links coming up at the end of the show. But yes, here he is. You're not going to want to miss a word or a stroke of this. Here, the master at work. <laughs> Our interview with Chris Aguileos now. Yeah. Now, some people in the legacy of Doctor Who, they need no introduction but still jokers like me insist on trying to uh, offer one so here's my try because in all avenues of popular culture there are figures that are known aren't there, by, by just one name and although this man's surname is enough to conjure up all sorts of, of evocative images and, and the childhood eagerness of a visit to WH Smith's on a Saturday afternoon to pick up a, a brand new Target paperback, for example. Still, we're going to use both of his names this afternoon. It's only polite after all. Joining Simon and myself this time, it's a very, very special guest. We've got illustrator, designer and artist Chris Akileos with us today. Hello. Hello, Chris. Here at last. We've had a bit of a journey getting here, haven't we? But we're, we're all here. Simon's here, I'm here, you're here. And oh boy, have we got some... We've got a hell of a career to talk about here, haven't we? You've, you've had such a long career, built up a huge body of work, haven't you, over five decades now? It is, yes. I started work in, 19, in the summer of 69. A fabulous year. Ah, just as the Beatles were packing it in, you were picking exactly. it up. Exactly. <laughs> because we know your work, don't you? You're one of the most distinctive and frankly I'm going to say this anyway <laughs> frankly the best at what you do creating visuals to match works by everyone from Michael Moorcock to Edgar Rice Burroughs and you've imagined haven't you where entire fantasy realms and kingdoms of, of your own haven't you but but then there's Doctor Who you're so strongly tied to Doctor Who in print and you have been for pretty much as long as there have been Doctor Who books, haven't you? But we're, we're now really close. We're weeks away from the publication of a brand new book, which is collecting all of your work, isn't it, in chronological order, connected with Doctor Who from Candy Jar Books. We're, we're going to make some space on all our shelves for that. But what I thought I'd start with, just to go back to this TV show that the pair of us, Simon and myself, were absolutely obsessed with. But had you been aware of Doctor Who before you were commissioned to draw and paint it all? Yes, I was. I think everybody was. You know, it was such a big hit on the on the the old black and white TV sets. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, I was. I was watching it, and uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I couldn't understand the dialogue, of course, because I was learning the language. Uh, but the visuals really okay. um, excited me. You know, I was really into science fiction and fantasy at the time. Um, going into movies a lot, uh, a whole new world and culture was opening up to me. Because tell us a little bit about you, your background before you arrived in in in, in England, Chris. Because you were born in Cyprus, weren't you? I was born in Cyprus uh, a long time ago in 1947, and uh, completely di different world then, especially there. What, what what was it that brought you over to the UK? My mother was widowed, very, and she was very young. Uh, lost my father when I was five years old, so. Um, lived outdoors mainly running wild in the orange groves and uh having fun playing cowboys and indians and uh robin hood or something like that because we saw um the flaming arrow star starring bert lancaster i remember and so we came home all came home and made bows and arrows and oh it's just just fantastic childhood you know that i wouldn't swap you for anything were you always artistic as a child, though, Chris? Uh, I was in a in a in a sort of practical way, not in drawing. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. went to school, of course, and uh, I, I don't. Rem I think we had an art class, but I remember doing all the drawings on the, on the chalkboard with different coloured chalks when it came to celebration dates, like the eighteen twenty one uh, uprising of the freedom of Greece from the Turks. And we used to have all these heroes, and I uh, used to draw them on the on, on the on the on the board. Uh, but personally, I, I I just run along and played. You know, I, I I used to make things. We used to make our own toy guns and arrows, like I said. And uh, shad shadow puppets was a big thing. We used to we used to cut out cardboard and uh, make these shadow puppets, which. Uh, it got out of fashion, I think, since yeah. TV came on. <laughs> well, this is all. This is all the sort of thing. Is it feeds your imagination, really? And that's particularly when we're children. Yeah. It, it's your imagine. Your imagination sort of. It's almost too big to be <laughs> to be confined by your own head, isn't it? And any way in which you can express yourself, yes. we do as children. I think sometimes without even thinking about yes, it. Yes, I, I think television ruined a lot of things. Uh, if you if you can imagine children with no TV, you know, and outdoors, they quickly yeah. develop differently than they do now. Uh, they use their imagination much more. They use their bodies physically a lot more, and they're playing in the dirt. I mean, they they enrich their immune system even. You know, uh, it's much better way of life. <laughs> so, when you moved over to the UK, where did you move to, and did you then find that obviously your life changed very drastically from Completely. playing in the orange groves to suddenly? Yeah completely changed i mean we came over and we were in the suburbs of london and uh, uh lived in a couple of rooms you know and it was very difficult for me um physically and mentally as it was for my mother and my sisters i have three sisters and uh, uh it was it was a bad time to move to england uh there was um, very low tolerance of foreigners and not just uh, black people, but also anybody, you know, and uh, we, we were Cypriots. So, you know, the whole thing was very difficult. Um, and, did you, and did you speak English at that point, Chris? No, not a word. So I had to pick things up uh, as I went along. Uh, the school was a nightmare. And so I couldn't do any academic exams. Uh, you know, two years later, you have to take exams or leave the school at 14. So I concentrated on academic, uh, non-academic subjects such as woodwork, metalwork, pottery and art. And uh, I was allowed to stay further than the fourth year in order to take those exams, which I did and pass them. And uh, in the end, I was in the sixth year and I was vice president of my house. And I was terrified of standing up and reading, you know. <laughs> It was a ridiculous situation to be in, but um, you know, I quickly learned to, 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 you know, adapt and move on. And uh, uh, my glory days was really going into art college, which my art teacher encouraged me to do, and uh, I, I really blossomed there. 
so they'd recognise your talent with with this sort of not just with the artistic the artistic skills yeah. and that way of looking at things, but also the practical skills that you've got as well, being good with your hands in making yes. things too. Yeah, I was very good in the in in the woodwork and metalwork class and pottery. I could do things, you know, very well, and the teachers really loved me and uh, <laughs> encouraged me. And I didn't need much encouragement. I just loved doing all of that stuff, and uh, I still do. I still do a lot of practical works around the house and that so how long did art college last then how long uh, i was there from 66 to 69 or maybe so i was there at 65 i can't remember but i was there like four years three or four years the first year was um just just general subjects drawing and painting and uh, and all that and after that you have to choose a, a career i I wanted to do illustration. I knew what I wanted to do at a very early age, which is a great advantage, you know. And you got good guidance at art college to to make to make yeah. that happen. To make contacts in the industry as well, or did did you just go around knocking doors before you'd even left art college? Presumably, you'd assembled a portfolio at that point. To, well, no, to take um, around with you. You you specialize on a subject, which I did on technical and scientific illustration. Just because you had the word illustration in it, I wanted to illustrate books. And uh, or comics. Comics was a big, big love of mine. You know, I I collected so. comics because I couldn't couldn't read the language. You know, couldn't read the language or anything. So, and we had nothing like it in in the Cyprus. You know, all that visual reference materials in there, and and, and well, and the drawings, the art was fantastic. So it, it just. So did you read the Eagle, Chris? I had. I bought them all. I had the Eagle. I had the Lion. I had the Look and Learn. I had um, got up Swift was one other one. I, there were so many. I pick up anything that had decent drawings in it. There's an artist working on there, and of course uh, the American imports also I collected. They just started around that point, hadn't they? Because I recognise some of Fra- uh, Frank Hamps- Frank Hampson's influence on you just, just a little. Just to correct so, you, it's, it's, it's not Hampson. It's Frank Bellamy. Frank Bellamy. It's Frank Bellamy. Bellamy. Who, who of course did he did a lot of it he oh, did a lot okay. of the um of the early radio times art for doctor who what what was it about frank bellamy that, that that influenced you chris what did you see in that well i did see that i mean i was a big fan of frank bellamy uh from years before when i used to buy the eagle comic he used to do this wonderful yeah. central s- spread you know of glorious drawings of heroes the spartan you know and he was just wonderful I, I couldn't wait for the eagle to come i had it on order and uh, the postman used to deliver it our first thing on wednesday morning i still remember it's wednesday morning so i used to get up especially early on wednesday morning to pick up the comic and and go to school and then i'd be reading it in school uh i remember this very clearly and copied the drawing sometimes you know and uh, just I adored Frank Bellamy's work. Um, he later did, he moved on from there and he, and he did, um, for another comic, I think he did um, Thunderbirds. I didn't like that so much. He used a different, more loose style and it's all, it wasn't historical, you know. I, I'm more attuned to historical, the past than the, than the future, you know. Carl, that's um, really odd that you say that, though, because, of course, you're so intrinsically linked with Doctor Who and, and yeah. so many, probably, I think all but one of your Doctor Who covers is science fiction. I can only think of the Crusaders that you did that's historical. Your science fiction artwork is, is second to none. So it's odd that you say, actually, you identify with the past more than you do the future. I do. I'm much, comfortable, much more comfortable... Um, drawing or painting um, a galleon you know or um, <laughs> or a viking or you know anything like that than uh, a guy in a spacesuit or rockets you know? <laughs> all that texture all that texture you can play with this. ah yes yes i was so into history and mythology you know that i carried on that tradition so you know, I've, I've got loads of books on the subjects and I'm still very interested in it. Ancient history, the further back you go, the more interesting it gets. I'm, I'm actually looking at pretty much every one of your Doctor Who covers now in a new light. Because okay. well, well, the reason I'm saying that is when you say that, actually when I look at a lot of these covers, they almost look historical. They don't look spacey, if you know what I mean. They, they have that 
I, I, I can see now that they are almost historical in style. They've got a classical yes, look classical to them. Classical is probably the better, better word. Um, so, so they don't look like, for example, like Close Encounters, the third kind of something. They look very romantic. And now I can see possibly why that is, because actually you're influenced more historically. And so these could be almost, as I say, historical pieces of artwork. They just happen to be with spaceships and, uh, and, 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 and aliens. No, I'm, by nature, I'm classical in style. You know, I, I love realism and um, strive to do so. Accuracy in anatomy and whatever I happen to be drawing. So I can't do stylized too much or cartoons. I um, just can't do that at all. Uh, it's one reason why I didn't become a comic strip artist, which I was very tempted to. You know, for that, you have to be doing it for years to develop a, a style, you know. And, and if it's a little bit graphic, the better. That's why I love Bellamy's work, you know, with his stylized. Um, stuff that it he hits used. that middle ground perfectly, but I, doesn't it? But I think it, you're yeah. doing yourself a disservice, Chris, because I mean, I think some of your some of your Who covers. I mean, at the moment, I'm I'm holding up the Daleks, uh, yeah. which is one of your first covers. I mean, that is really, really graphic. That is that's. That, that, mm. So I think you I think you're putting yourself down when you say you can't do a comic book style graphic because that there is nothing more comic book style graphic. Yeah, it is pure graphics, as you say. It's nothing to. It's not. Um, it's not a painting. You know, I keep saying this to people. I didn't do paintings when I did the Doctor Who's. I did graphic montages. You know, uh, color drawings. You know. And I tried to encapsulate the whole story on just one little area of, what is it, six inches square or four inches square? Which is, wasn't easy, but um, this is what I strive to do. Your book covers are so important to Doctor Who fans, certainly of our age, simply because, because we had, in those days, nothing whatsoever uh, visually from a story whatsoever. There, there was just no photos, there was no comic at that point, there was no magazine, nothing. So there were no photos. So that was it. Your little six inch illustration, that was yeah. our window into that particular story. Visually, that was all we had. That's why I think these book covers are so important to us, because they just represent that entire Doctor Who story and one little piece of artwork. Yeah. And funnily enough, when you talk, you talk about comic strips there, Chris, when I, I was just, I've just been picking out this to uh, the cover to the uh, Auton Invasion yeah. there. Now, to me, that's very similar to Frank Bellamy's work. That's, I can totally see that now you've, now you've mentioned it. And that's so comic strippy. Yeah. You know, I love the way he used to put heads in circles amongst all the other. Um, yeah, I learned a lot Beautiful from stuff. Frank Bellamy and other comic strip artists. Jack Kirby was the American artist that I adored. I still do, um, and I met him once in San yeah. Diego or Comic Con, and uh, oh, really? to my amazement, he knew all about me, and he said <laughs> he loved my work as well. So it was great. <laughs> yeah. That's that's very that's very cool. So as as you were you were leaving art college, and you'd got this this passion, and you'd got this. Mm this thing that you wanted to express, what did your family feel about it? Were they surprised that, that you'd found art, that you were going to make a career out of all of this, all of this imagery? Well, my family was my three sisters and my grandmother then, and my mother, most importantly. She was the breadwinner. She, I mean, she, it's amazing, really, that she allowed me to to follow my passion, to go to art college, first of all, instead that. of um, becoming a mechanic or something, you know, to bring money in the family and to pursue what I wanted to do. It was amazing, really, for that time, you know. Yeah. So other than Doctor Who, with thinking back to the late 60s, I immediately think of things like 2001 A Space Odyssey, the Kubrick yes. film, and TV shows like Mission Impossible, and the, uh, the Spaghetti Westerns, the Clint Eastwood. Yes. Was all that in the mix as well? Like I said, I mentioned before, I used to love going to the cinema. And when we came to England in 1960, oh my God, the cinemas are full of these amazing movies that were coming in, the, the epics. I mean, if you go back and you look at the films that were done from 60 to 69, you know, 70. I mean, in the early 60s, the 60s started with West Side Story, you know, fabulous. And, and as an immigrant, uh, it also struck a chord with us, you know, me and my sister. 
It's such a graphical film oh, as well, isn't it? That? I love it. My favourite music. I see it again and again. It's very, and very then, stylized, isn't it? it? It's fabulous. But then you have the epics. You know, you had Lawrence of Arabia in '61, and I remember going to see that. You know, and, and be, uh, in, in Holloway Odeon. You know, and it was just it changed my life. That movie, and it's still the best movie ever made, in my opinion. A big movie. El Cid, you had Cleopatra, you had Spartacus and the Argonauts. Oh. And it plays to all those films, they play to your classical sensibilities oh, oh, yes. too, don't they? You're, you're yes, exactly. I, I love film. And if I was coming from a, a rich background, perhaps I would have gone to film school, you know. And because that would be my love, of, you know, to, to have worked as, in movies as a, as a director or something. Because I, I understand action. I understand action very much, um, very well, and uh, I know this because I, I've been to sets, you know, um, the set of Willow, when I designed the costumes for Willow, and uh, saw George Lucas direct and Ron Howard and that, and uh, I know if I had the training, I would have been uh, quite a good director. In well, another I life, I would have loved to see a Chris Achilles film. Oh. For many, from from before I left college, even I wanted to do movies like uh, adventure movies with realism in it. You know, with with uh, like they were done more recently. You know, with fantastic action and uh, opening of movies. I remember going to see um, the Longest Day. Have you seen that? A big epic, yeah. the Longest yeah. Day. Oh, the war film. I called yeah. it the big, the longest bore. <laughs> first hour of boredom you know basically and leaving the action just for the last half an hour or something stupid i uh, i wanted to open a movie like spielberg opened it with raiders of the lost ark you know uh fantastic opening and when i saw that i just stood on my chair you know i just jumped up and said that's the way you do it <laughs> yes I, I just loved all that i love movies very much well there's so much energy in your work and they've you know for all we've talked about comic strips already Mm. and and history they've got a sort of dreamlike quality about them as well and i think that movies the history of cinema it was born out of desire wasn't it to to sort of put people's dreams on on film on a screen in in front of Mm. people and a way of sharing dreams and i think that's really i mean good illustration it does kind of do that what I was what I was wondering about is your your very distinctive style, which you know we all know and we all recognise that now and the the hallmarks yeah. of it. But which which came first? Was it your work on the Doctor Who line, or had, were you already perfecting that style and that and that balance before but, the commission okay. for, for um, Doctor Who with Target? The style of the Doctor Who covers came from my college uh, course which was, like I said, technical and scientific illustration. And in that, we learned two main things. One had to use a, a special pen, which is called repeatograph pen, which was yeah. new technology, really, which was a technical pen. I had to do line very clearly, and had to illustrate the machinery and all that with, with this pen. And the other thing was the airbrush, uh, which was, uh, again, uh, a tool that was available since the 40s, I believe, and before. And the pen was also used for the dot technique for scientific illustration. If you look at scientific... Uh, for more more intricate, for the more intricate... Yeah, detail. if you look at archaeologists, for instance, when they do a drawing of a find, they use the same technique of drawing a skull with the dots, you know, to get it right. It's a coincidence that Bellamy was using a similar technique, the line and the dot. Um, so I, having that skill developed in me, and then I was asked to do, uh, for instance, the uh, Fistful of Dollar books that uh, I think I was doing in, a, in, in the same time or a similar time that I was asked to do the Doctor Who's. It was um, natural for me to progress from, from that to the Doctor Who's, which I knew it needed a graphic style. And and I I was very aware then that I was doing those covers for children, not for adults. 
And children like a lot of clarity, something simple, not too complicated, but very colourful at the same time. I, I still look back on those covers and I'm still amazed at your bold, well, what, what I think is a bold decision to have, have most times put the Doctor in black and white and the, and the monsters in colour. And of course, I, I think it's very unlikely that anybody would go down that route today. And of course, that's one of the things that makes these these the, your covers so so remarkable and so memorable. What? But it was a very counterintuitive thing to think. Oh, I know. I'll put the Doctor in black and white. Where do, can you remember where that decision came from and why that decision was there? I, I, I wish I can remember. I don't think it was like, shall I do him in colour or shall I do him in black and white? Because what happened is I I would draw the whole thing. With the, with the pencil and then the pen. So everything, the background, whatever it is, and the dotted faces and all this. And then it's this black and white line drawing. And then I would start to color in. Now, I, I don't do color wraps. I never did, like a lot of artists do. I just distinctly feel the color come through. So I started with the background, putting colors in the background. As I filled in the background, the doctor's heads just stood out you know, much more but surrounded by this technicolor background, you know. So I thought, you know, that's great. I shall leave it like that. And so it's um, almost accidental. Well, it, it, it's accidental that um, I didn't take it any further. Uh, I think it might have been. But later on, you know, when it came to the last one I did was the, the arc in space, I think. And that, as you can see, is completely different. <laughs> completely different. Why is that yeah. so? Why is that such a different cover for you? Uh, you from think? the early ones, it's completely mm. different. I mean, it's no, not much drawing in there at all. The the um, the insert is drawn and then filled in in color, uh, and the doctor's head is a pure watercolor drawing. And I, I was very aware that was the last one I was going to do, and. Uh, I don't know, maybe I just wanted to do something different. Because that's very much a painting, it, although it's still got a very graphic style, it is very much a painting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and look at it, it's very punchy. I mean, yeah. if, if, if a 12-year-old kid saw that on a, on a bookshelf, you know. <laughs> yes, but, that's, I'm happy. but that's true of every one of your covers, Chris. I mean, this is the whole, whole point, and I can still remember going into... As, as Dan said at the top, going into WH Smith's. And these covers just literally exploded off the shelf. I mean, they, they just did. And I can still remember just looking at the, this piece of art and just seeing this word, in, in most of them, seeing this word, Achilleos, in the corner. I'm thinking, what does that even mean? As a 10-year-old, I didn't even know <laughs> yes. what Achilleos was. What was that? Your hallmark, yes. Chris. Yeah, your hallmark. <laughs> and I, I was just thinking how these things how these things do evolve because you know I work in this sector too, and I was just looking at the Ark in Space cover there and that bright yellow. Of course, you know for for Target and anybody else who's selling a product because this is commercial art that we're talking mm. about here. It's not fine art; it's commercial yeah. art. It's there to sell something. And I suppose when a new set of books were about to come out, then those children, like like Simon and myself, who would be in the bookshop looking for the new ones, if if the latest lot. If the covers were slightly evolved in some way, like with mm. that bright yellow trim, then that would really stand out. That's a new one, Mum. I <laughs> want that. <laughs> that that sort of thing. That does it does sort of provoke that that kind of reaction. Yeah. I mean, you were there, weren't you, from the very very beginning of this range, the the target range when 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 uh, it was Universal Tandem, Tandem was it that set yes. it all up. And so you you very much defined this look, and although other artists did did come along sort of in between and then afterwards, you really defined this whole line. And you were there for some years, weren't you? So how long was it between your your first illustrations and that Arkansas um, was the final one? And what sort of feedback did you get from the people running the line? Did they let you do pretty much what you wanted and and be led by your own instincts? Um, I stopped doing them in seventy seven, and I think I started. Um I started doing them in 73, so um, it's quite a few years. I mean, on that period, I was also developing my love of uh, fantasy art mm. and working on a lot on, the, on that angle. 
It's fair to say, isn't it? You weren't solely working on Doctor Who. No, no, uh, no. I, 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 I didn't put all my eggs in one basket. I, I, I did <laughs> lots of uh, illustration. I started with commercial art, advertising and all this, because I was very competent airbrush artist. And it was only, you know, a, a few of us in London then. Um, I had a lot of work, and uh, which brought in decent money. Um, book covers did not. They took twice as long and didn't bring much money at all. Can you remember how the original commission first came about for Doctor Who? How were you approached, or did you approach them? I was... Um, when I when I left college, um, I spent six months working on a magazine, and then I was made redundant, doing technical maps and, and, and technical drawings. And then I was made redundant. And then I thought, um, by then I was uh, I was going to get married in six six months time or something. So big responsibility. So I I thought I need a job. You know what do I do? And uh, so I've. I got on the train, went to London, and went into Follows Bookshop. And I, I went through the shelves and, and started making calls, you know. And <laughs> um, one of them uh, was Universal Tandem. And they put me in touch with their art director. They said, go and show your portfolio to him, not us. So I went to Great Portland Street, where he was, and I showed him my portfolio. And uh, he, he thought um, I was good. And he gave me a couple of fantasy book covers to do, which I did, and uh, liked them. So he said, then he said, to my amazement, he said, I need someone to work in the studio with me. I've got too much work uh, for myself. Would you be willing to come and work for me as a freelance basis, nine to five? So I agreed to that. His guy's name was Brian Boyle. Now, I wish I could reconnect with him because he'll have a lot to add to the Doctor Who story. So I worked with him for um, two or three years. And in that term, I learned so much. Um, I learned how to do the, really the, the graphic course, you know, at college, which I never did, which was uh, lettering and, um, yeah. and designing books and editorial stuff and photography even and all sorts of things. So I did a lot of covers for him, uh, including the designing of the cover, the look of the cover, how, how to design a, a book cover, which helped me enormously. So when I left there in, in, in 73, whatever it was, 72, 73, I, uh, he approached me, he was still hiring me for work, and I was working from home by then. And uh, he contacted me, he says, I've got three, three books, Chris, uh, it's about the the TV show Doctor Who, uh, do you want to do them? And uh, I said, yes, of course. And uh, I said, I know Doctor Who, I watch it and uh, familiar with it. And that's how he started uh, working for him. It was a brand new thing. And I was doing fantasy and all this sort of uh, stuff at the time. You know, it was difficult to know what the publishers expected of, of, of them, you know. Mm. So I did a rough of, uh, and I wish I had that rough, of the Zabi with a, a giant ant, you know, a real life ant on there. Or, or, and the publishers took it to the BBC and the BBC <laughs> came back and they said, absolutely not, we need the creatures to of show the creatures from the show. And that was fine for me. I, I said, it came back to me, you know, I said to Brian, I said, that's fine, but I need reference for these creatures. I, you know, <laughs> they want me to draw their monsters. They have to provide me with the reference photographs. Yeah, these episodes haven't been on the TV for nearly 10 yeah. years at that point. And um, so he, he approached the BBC and the, pub, the publishers and the BBC, and they sent a couple of pictures of the Zabi, you know, the, the ant people yeah. and the moth. And uh, that's how we came to do that. Yeah, it's still a great cover. Oh, it's and a, I filled it in with the graphics. And, uh, and then after that, I did the, um, the Daleks. Of course, I had no idea what color the Daleks were or, or the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, police box, the TARDIS. So I just filled it with color, you know. And you did and the TARDIS uh, pink? Yeah, I did a pink TARDIS. 
And it works, it works, it works so well. And it's really, really funny because you never actually notice that the TARDIS is pink. It, 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 it just works. The colours just work brilliantly. Well, that's and what the... I did. I followed my instinct with colour because I did those coloured, uh, I'm pointing in now, uh, the, you know, the stars and the planets inside yep. the Doctor coat. And I followed the colour through yeah. to, you know, it's colour balancing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the difference between graf graphic art, isn't it, and, and a, a fine yes, art. Yes. And this is, again, one of the reasons why these kind of covers absolutely fired my imagination as, imagination as a child, because I'm looking at the Doctor and I can see, you know, the, the planets and the stars and the galaxies all in, in, inside the Doctor. And it just... Yeah. That, Absolutely fired my imagination far more than a photorealistic painting would have done. Yes, um, exactly. That that's the beauty of it. You see, I am blessed with a very good eye for graphics and uh, designing. Go back and look at these things over the years, and I, I always see new things in them. It's just mm. a beautiful cover. The Daleks, in particular, is just a beautiful cover. You know, you could just sit and look at that forever, and and there there is a world within that that one little tiny piece of artwork and as I said I think that's what set my imagination alight as a child yeah. and bearing in mind you know obviously when I was reading all of these books and looking at this art again I hadn't yeah. seen any of these stories I wasn't born when these went out I, I had no reference in my brain of what the Zabi would look like this is what this is why I knew what a Zabi looked like because of your artwork yeah. um, and so when you ultimately see the television program it's it's a disappointment <laughs> because the artwork <laughs> is so good <laughs> And the Daleks don't don't have fire coming out of their guns. No, oh, they should have. They, they should, should have. have. And again, I mean, Union Walls didn't allow fire in the, in the studio. Well, one of my absolute favourite covers of yours is Planet of the Daleks, which I've got up yeah. here in the poster. And one of the reasons I love it is because of the fire coming out of the gun stick. That's better than anything yes. that ever appeared on television. I love the fact that you know there's. It, it's this it's this somehow this fire that's literally dripping yes in a real it's like a flamethrower that's yes. what it reminds me of a flame it's the thrower. dripping it's this it's it's these spots yeah. you like the drips <laughs> yeah. I, I, it just looks <laughs> phenomenal what wouldn't what 12 year old wouldn't be excited by that cover yeah. i mean that, that but it makes the dalek more than in tin can it makes him dangerous like a tank absolutely and this yeah. is why they they, they the, the truth of it is these like these covers look far better than than yeah. anything that you would have seen on television mm. in Planet of the Darks. They're very trunky, they're very they're very dustbin tin can. And on that, that's just You've got weight, weight oh. and power. I'm just looking at the Crusaders cover oh. here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we talk about the the historical angle there with the you've yes. got the the battle ensuing above and, and the doctor sort of looking on, powerless to stop it all. And, and King Richard peering over his shoulder. Okay, it tells the whole story somehow, Chris. Uh -huh. and another it, beautiful it, balance it of was, colour and light and yeah, shade. Yeah, it was the third one, because they came in threes, and this was the first three. The Crusades was really difficult to do, because the BBC had no reference for me at all for, for King Richard, except the actor's head That's with cool. the crown, and, and uh, again, a, quite a poor picture of William Hartnell. So I can but make the, the rest up. The Hartnell on this is just absolutely magnificent. <laughs> He's a little bit round-headed and, uh, I don't know, I, I'm full of self-criticism. But um, You really jumped on the chance to illustrate the battle scene yes. above with, with the Well, I love all that, you know. It was in, um, in all the comics and the history books I was reading. I was fascinated by the Crusades and still are, you know, the Knights Templars and all that stuff. You know, they were, they're not taken from the TV series. Case by case, you wouldn't know which stories you were going to get pictures from or no. not. So it was it was literally a case by case yeah. job. Yeah. And later on, I, I remember uh, being sent to this uh, uh, this th this building in uh, off uh, Oxford Circus, I think, which wasn't too far from where um, Brian Ball Studio was. It belonged to the BBC, and they held all the old records. I was told it'd be all right, just tell him who you are and that you, you want some photo reference of Doctor Who and now they'll show you. So I went in there and I went upstairs in a little room and the girl said they're all in there in this grey filing cabinet, take what you want. So I went in there and it had all the episodes, you know, in files. And honestly, I'll go to the one I want and there was like three or four <laughs> black and whites and that was it. And if you're lucky you find one that you can use. 
for the Loch Ness Monster, for instance, there was nothing of the monster, nothing. And uh, I said, look, <laughs> either I'm going to make up the monster or you find something. And uh, they searched everywhere. Eventually, they found a little Polaroid <laughs> of the head of the monster. So I had a tiny little blurred, you know, picture of um, the Loch Ness Monster to work from. It was always a struggle to find reference. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they're, they're as, as striking as they are, because you had so little to work with. It really, yeah. so you, you, you had to use your imagination. You had to make very little work. Um, and maybe you worked, yeah. I don't know, did, did you work extra hard on these? Or was it a case that they were, they were just quick and easy and you had no idea that we'd be looking at these in 40 years later? And so you oh. churned them out <laughs> as quickly as you could. Well, I was doing, uh, like I said, my, I didn't consider them as my main work. It was considered, you know, I was doing that a long time and it was steady work. And I knew I would take five days to do one. And I knew, you know, uh, a week, shall we say. So, uh, time. yeah, I'd take a week with the delivery and all this, you know. I knew that I had security, you know, that I would get paid. So it's a good, secure job to do. The oh. thing that I'm sort of a little bit bitter about is that I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to be into the success of these book covers. I was kept in the dark, you know. I was. What you were kept in the dark about how well they yes, were selling exactly. the actual books. The only hint I got is when the um, the, the the lady editor, I think she was. Uh, she said, Chris, we're getting a lot of letters. Some letters she would pass on to me from children. And she said, um, we like to start a fun club around you and, and, and the covers. And I sort of laughed at that. <laughs> and I said, uh, what would that involve? And she said, well, you, the kids will send you lots of letters and you have to reply to them and all this. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no way. I can't write letters, you know, this is out of the question. So I didn't do it. But that showed me how popular they were, but not uh, the commercial success that they were. As I found out later reading other articles from people who were saying actually the target range, the Doctor Who range, was holding up the whole publishing house. Um, I, I think what you're talking about as well, Chris, is I think if I think I'm right in saying that they use the cover to the second monster book. I think the BBC, if I remember right, used the artwork for for the second monster book in a, a variety advert in the United States to promote the see the television series, not the target books. Yes, that's what they happens. Used, it was a huge deal, as you could imagine. This was going to be franchised and. Uh, mm -hmm shown all over America, not just a uh, local station. So it's worth millions, you know, and they use my artwork. They use my artwork to do it. They didn't use photographs, you know, and at what, from at what the show. Did you find out that they'd used your artwork? Did you find out just purely by chance? I found out because a friend of mine who lived in New York sent me, uh, sent me the uh, TV Times. American TV Times, and he sent it to me, and I, I just, I, I was furious. You know, the art director was new. He didn't know really this, how big, you know, my work was on those covers. To I approached the Association of Illustrators to get get support, and they didn't want to know. So I was, you know, I was left to to think. You know, I became the pariah. You know. <laughs> It really does make you yeah. stop and think, because I, I did wonder how proprietorial you may have been about it at the time, whether whether you were at all or whether it was just another job, or whether whether when it did sort of wind down and you moved on, whether you felt like it, you'd got things out of your system and you were happy to move on. But it sounds like you had quite a lot that you wanted to continue well, to I give. I didn't want to give to it up. Range. I enjoyed doing them and it was regular work, but they made it impossible for me to carry on. They have no rights, you know, the only rights they had is for the British and Commonwealth book cover rights only. All they had to do is approach me and tell me the truth, say, Chris, we're, we want to use your artwork to launch a series in America, and here's a fee for you, you know, whatever that would be. 
yeah, on, on the one hand, it's obviously very, very flattering. It's a, it's a great compliment that they want to use your artwork to, to promote the series in America. So, so I don't doubt that you would have responded very well to that, but there is a way and a means to doing that. And all the time, these books were continuing to sell more and to get reprinted over exactly and over that. and over I was, and over exactly. again. Exactly. I was just about to tell you that uh, not long ago, I had um, I had a, an interview, a meeting, you know, with uh, two of the writers... Terence Dix and uh, and the other guy, I forget his name. And we're sitting down being interviewed and Terence said it was so great, you know, uh, suddenly a, an envelope would arrive and it'd be a big fat check in there for another reprint of the of the Target books. And he was, you know, full of it, you know. And I said, uh, and he said to me, isn't that right, Chris? And I said, no, it's not. I said, <laughs> I said, I only just uh, I got paid once, and that was it. And they kept reprinting it and reprinting it and paying you guys fat checks. I never got a penny. So, so out of interest, are, are, are you still not getting any royalty payments, for example, for the for the for the um, the audio books, the the, the, the CDs? No, I do, I do for that. I do for that. Okay, uh, I do for that because it's they're using it for a different uh, repurposing it, different article. All together okay. for the audiobooks the, and uh, and even when I mean the BBC now is a different kettle of fish. They're, yes. they're, they're nicer people. Unfortunately, you were a victim to that style back in. We're talking obviously several yeah. decades. And that's how it was back then. People didn't care. There was no such thing as a brand. The BBC didn't care about branding like they do now. Sure. So it's very very different now. Um, yeah, but that's that's very rough on you. Yeah, I mean, like I said, everybody was pay, getting paid really well, and I just got my initial fee, which wasn't very much, and that was it, you know. And then they kept reprinting them and reprinting them, and selling them to Australia and Canada, and they, you know. And then I, more recently, I discovered they were also sold in Holland. There was Dutch editions, and uh, I don't know what else. You know, you probably know more about it than I do. They are part of the of the history of Doctor Who in a very, yeah. very real way, um, yeah. and so and they so, kept it from me. They, they kept the whole big success away from me. Maybe they were afraid that I would ask for more money, and maybe I would have done. You know, and why not? And why not? If, if it was working and you were selling, then why why wouldn't? Yeah, you? as you can see, the covers after that. It's not for me to say anything about them, but I'm sure they didn't sell as many as my covers did. Well, last year, when Terence Dix, we mentioned Terence Dix a little while ago, when he passed yeah. away, we recorded an episode all about the Target books and put it out there. And we've got a good cross-section of listeners, some of whom are a great deal younger than, than Simon and myself, and uh, who are just sort of discovering the book range for the first time, either through re reprints or the audio books that we mentioned. And we had a lot of feedback saying, oh, it's fascinating, and how we sort of we just sort of opened, the, opened the, the story of the Target books. But for any of those who may be listening out there, how many of the covers did you actually paint in the end? Have you any idea the exact number or a rough amount? Not offhand, I don't know. I think um, it's about 30, isn't it? About 30 odd, I think. It's about 30, yeah. But I also yeah. um, I did the Thai food special, a bit of advertising using Doctor Who for those collecting cards, and the uh -huh. special monster books. I did two of those. That's and uh, larger and one of Tom Baker. Right? And that that was it, yeah. That was the amazing world of Doctor Who. That's right, the amazing world of Doctor Who, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a and it's a beautiful piece of artwork. That is, it kind of encapsulates yeah. in a way everything of your style, and that one piece of artwork is yeah, all yeah. in there on that. On that. Absolutely <laughs> glorious. Have you got a favourite piece, Chris? Or is it a bit like trying to pick a favourite child? <laughs> no, it's not like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> go on, then. What's your favourite? Well, I I used to like uh, Genesis. Um, oh, okay was my favorite mm. this was uh you know wh when i was doing them yeah i still like that very much yeah i mean too uh, well. the one thing i think about genesis is the is the rendering uh, the, uh, on the dalek and on davros is just exquisite i mean the detail and the actual yeah. way you have painted those is just truly useful. but also the they chose they chose the right color for the lettering on the top the red the red I mean, if you look some of the others, this is why I, yeah. I would get really angry and disappointing and angry, you know. When you look at, for instance, the um, the Claws of Axos, 
and it's, it's all yellow and orangey ready, you know, and then you get this cold blue lettering on the top and it's just awful. <laughs> it just doesn't go at all. Or, or if you look at um, Carnival of Monsters, yeah. I mean, that, that blue is yeah, just awful up mean. there, you know. It should have been a, a more a, a sympathetic colour to the illustration. And that's what graphic design is about as yeah. well, is it's the complement of the illustration with the copy, with the the corporate yeah. dress of those logos and things like that, the house style. I mean, that, that copy of Genesis of the Daleks that Simon was just holding up, what I love about it as well, what really stands out is that black, that really thick yeah. black board that's thicker than usual. That was obviously a, a deliberate choice yes, too. Yes, I did that to that hold everything gift. together. And I gave you that sort of uh, parchment look, you know, Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's just right. You know, why, why did you put why did you put Tom in a circle on that? I've always wondered. I used to look at this cover as a child. And I used to think, why did the artist put Tom well, I, in the circle? There? I do that a lot. You know, I, I do the same with um, other other ones. I also did that on uh, Claws of Axles. John Pertwee's in a circle there. If you look at that. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's great. I mean, again, as a child, I loved that. But I was intrigued as to what would make yeah. an artist think to do something like that. Because, again, it's 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 somewhat counterintuitive. It's not necessarily what you would expect that to, to be done. I think sometimes it makes them look almost sainted. Well, they're, they're in a frame. And it's also almost like a TV screen, you know, looking out of uh, a hole in the wall, you know. Just, it's, uh, it's just stuff. It's just clever and it, it, it fires the imagination. So, if this isn't your favourite anymore, then Genesis, what is now then? Well, I'm moving on. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, uh, let me get the titles right. The Ice Warriors is a perfect cover. It's the second time that I didn't use the Doctor's head in there. Did you, you get problems with that? At first, I, I did. But you know, when I was doing them, Simon, I. I I would just, I, I had no, I was left to my own devices. They knew I, I, that I, I knew what I was doing, you know, uh, because the books were so, so successful, you know, they're selling so many and all this for the covers. And so they left me alone to just get on with it. I didn't have to show roughs to an art director. I didn't have to discuss it with anyone. And the first thing they see it is when I deliver the artwork in the office. So I didn't even go to the art director in, in, in later on. Uh, I used to go straight to, to Tandem Books and, and, and unveil it. I think it was the Tenth Planet. Uh, it's the first time I left the doctor's, yeah, the doctor's head off. They just got really upset with that and wanted me to All right. to do it again, basically, because you can't correct those once they're done. They're done. And I, I said no. Because I knew it's 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 a good cover, you know. It didn't. It doesn't need the doctors. Everybody knows. I said to them, everybody knows. Is you know, the doctors in that story. You it's, a to show him it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a brilliant cover, and it's one of my all-time favourites. Simply because this was the very very first um, book I had. Uh, the Doctor Who book I had, I actually had it as a hardback, and I and I've managed to track down the hardback that from from the from the library um, because that was where I borrowed it from to begin with. So I've got it in hardback, no. and, and this is a, that cover as a child really inspired me because actually it hadn't got the Doctor on. So of course, because again yeah. I hadn't seen this on TV, I had no idea which Doctor this was even in this story. Yeah, that made it all the more exciting then. <laughs> uh, but also I tried to encapsulate the story there. You see the Cyberman, the planets, yeah. this Earth being engulfed by the power of the Cyberman from their planet. It's brilliant. Um, it's almost like an arm reaching around, isn't it? Yeah. Energy from yeah, it's an invasion yeah. taking yeah. over, you know. Come, coming back to your ice warriors, this is yeah. you know, this one of the things that I love. It's Again, it's all this fizzy energy. It's this fizzy <laughs> Yes. And this again is what as a child just literally electrified me rather than just having it's what alive. is a beautiful yeah. rendering of an ice warrior. It's having that, that, that fizzing energy around it. But literally yeah, I always like, you're so level. right. You're, you're so right because I like adding a, another dimension which is sound. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've, I've observed children when they look at books or something or they're playing. Even by themselves, they make a noise. You know, mm -hmm. they're always making noises. You know, <laughs> bang, bang, boom. You know, whatever. You know, 
I do that now. Yeah, I do that now, exactly. <laughs> so but, but that... I, I, I loved all that. And, and with my knowledge of comic illustration also, which they added all that in there, Kazap and all this, you know, it's wonderful. So and I was it... building up to that. So after the after the Tenth Planet, and and uh, I repeated it in the in the Ice Warriors. You know, I I left the Doctor out, and I put I put sound in there. I put those energy bars sparkling on, you know, surrounding the screaming girl, you know. And it's absolutely uh, that. That's part of the reason why I love your work so much. And and daft as it sounds, as a child, I and I still love the fact that as Dan says, there's this big thick black border, but the energy yeah. is sparking outside the black border. So again, to me as a child, and and all of your colours are the same. You know, the seeds of doom has got a big black border. Things are exploding out of it, and so some out of it. That, yeah, it's just oh, every element is tied and, to and I don't know, I can't explain it, why it is that it excites me to see that border with things breaking out from it, because somehow yeah. it's reaching out to me. Yeah, well and said. And is genius. It's very important. Yeah, with, the mon- with the monster outside and the Zygon inside and the Doctor yeah, even further yeah. back. Yeah. It's like they're breaking out of the TV set, you know, they're coming That's out. That's what I think it is, Chris. I think you're right. <laughs> It's this idea that everything is sort of breaking out and it's coming towards you and it's so much yeah. more energetic uh, th- 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 than it would be if it's just a flat piece of artwork. Yeah. Um, so all those little energy bolts, I mean, again, I mean, look at the three doctors. That's got to be one of the <laughs> best book covers of all time. And, and again, it's all those energy bolts. It's the fizzing energy that, that's just erupting around, around Omega that just sets the imagination going. Well, you've got to mention that. I've copied that from Jack Kirby. I'm not going to mention it because... <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say how kirby is. <laughs> I think everybody was. knows that now. Everybody knows that those hands yeah. are copied. It yeah. doesn't matter. One jot. Nobody cares. It doesn't lessen that piece of artwork. Did Kirby know, Chris? Did Jack know? I wish I had it to show it to him when I met him. <laughs> he would have been... We would have had a good laugh at it, you know. I'm sure. Well, I was wondering. You've painted or drawn... Well, certainly, certainly, sort of illustrated pretty much all of the doctors, haven't you? Because even since you've you've left Target, you do keep going back, and there are several several pieces up on your website, aren't there, of later doctors? But I was wondering, Chris, I, I suspect I know the answer, but is there one particular doctor that is you, that was your favourite to capture on the covers? Oh dear, um, when I was doing them, I suppose it's Patrick Troughton and Joe painting him if i had a decent picture of him he would have been uh, like i did on the abominable snowman uh, you know it's wonderful reference to work from he was great to draw and also i liked him as a doctor <laughs> do, yeah. do, uh, do, do you very expressive yeah. face isn't he lots of different expression for yeah, every single one right. i thought you were going to say pertwee that no, surprised me um Pertwee's fine as well, but he always complained that I drew his nose too big. He actually, he actually <laughs> wrote to the BBC. Oh, is that true? We've heard that yeah, story. He wrote to the BBC and to pass it down to me, to the publishers, and to me not to draw his nose big. <laughs> and uh, I still got he the letters so much. Still got the letters. He has got a large so nose. It's hilarious. Everyone's a Chris. So, yeah. so did you change it, Chris, or did you did you just carry on drawing it exactly the same as you were? I think I drew it even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on on the demons. Oh, if you look you at don't. the demons, the, or demons, I don't know how you pronounce it. I, I've made his nose glow a bit. Oh, I love that one. Can you see the colour of his nose? <laughs> yes. More so going movement. back to More. my favourites. Yes. Backtrack a yes. bit. Yes. yes. I mean, the, um, oh, yes. the, the Ice Warriors is great. I tell you another another reason why I like it so much because they actually use the right color for the logo, a yep. dark green color which goes yep. with the with the ice warrior. I think it's perfect. It is uh, perfect. now. More recently, that's been my favorite for a long time. But more recently, I'm looking again at um, the claws of Axos. I, I think that's that's a fantastic cover as well. But it's ruined by the blue lettering on the top. Absolutely ruined. If that was a sort of bright red, a rich red color, it would just make it so much better. Uh, but their illustration is it's really nice. And, and the quality of my drawing on, uh, on the creature 
it's 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 amazing. I don't think I can do that now. You'd have thought with all the reprints that they had, Chris, they might have. You know, they, if they'd have asked you if you'd have told them you'd have wanted that. No, no, the, no, the color no, of the logo for one. I was. It, you know, nobody asked my opinion about anything. No. <laughs> they just go oh. ahead and sell thousands of them. You're right. Claws of Axos is a beautiful <laughs> cover. And what I notice at looking of all of these covers, kind of almost in, in order, as it were, is that the earlier covers of yours start out in a way more stark and uh, uh, simplistic isn't the correct word, obviously, but they're more stark, they're more minimal, I guess. Yes. Whereas yes. once you're getting towards the, the, the into things like the tenth planet, seeds of doom, um, pyramids of Mars, the planet of the Daleks, the claws of Axos, they're getting much more dense, um, yes. less stylized in a way, and more dense in in the detail of the painting that's in there. Was that a deliberate thing, or did it just evolve, or why was that, do you think? It's because I had a larger area to work with. Um, uh, instead of the my illustration being a square area, if you like, yeah. of the early ones, it became an oblong area with a, a lot of area on the top to go behind yeah. the lettering. That's why you have all that sort of colouring going up there and all that. So with um, these early ones, you were told to keep it into a square frame and with the later yeah. ones, you were allowed yeah. to go larger. Yeah, and do the frame. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. We like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to the Fandom Podcast Network and all of the other awesome shows we have to offer. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, our weekly pop culture news podcast. Blood Kings, our Highlander podcast. Couch Potato Theater, our podcast celebrating our favorite movies. Time Warp, the fandom flashback podcast discussing a year in movies and our favorite pop culture topics. Enzo, the NFL podcast. Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville podcast. Hair Metal, the 80s and early 90s rock metal podcast. Type 40, our Doctor Who podcast. Lethal Mullet, a 1980s and 90s action film podcast. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. And our newest show, Making Treks, a new Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier with host Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. You can enjoy all of these great Fandom Podcast Network shows on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. Fandom Podcast Network is also on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Yes, we've teased and tantalised you there, now let us clothe you too. Head over to tpublic.com, search for the Fandom Podcast Network, and you'll find a store full of the team colours for all those shows on t-shirts, hats, mugs, and a TARDIS full of other items. Treat yourself, treat your other selves, and it all goes to support the network continuing to fill your ears with 100% fabulous fandom goodness. Because, I mean, I was, I was in, in, in the big San Diego con, you know, and there's all oh, these yes. new generation artists, you know, in their 40s and even 50s. And they'll come over and, and tell me the same thing. I bought your first book, Chris, Beauty and the Beast. And uh, yeah, I started by copying your paintings from there, you know, and all this. And these are famous artists now, you know. And I'm so, like, uh, ob- you know, overwhelmed and flattered by oh, this, you know. It's wonderful. I only, only became what I became because of my love of the, of the art in the comics. You know, of copying those guys. It inspires creativity. I think Doctor Who appeals to creative people. I think, well, the way you were talking about movies earlier on, Mm. I think movies and, and, and that kind of geekiness that we've all got... It appeals to creative people. I mean, Simon Simon was just holding up the Seeds of Doom cover there. That reminds me of a film poster. And having <laughs> spoken to you now, 
at, at length about the things that you love. It, I'm joining the dots, joining the dots <laughs> of Chris Akileos' work. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's true, it's true. So now I can see what's fed in yeah. where and, and how much you brought that was obviously particular to you and so idiosyncratic and, and that people have latched onto. And this is why you get all the all this feedback even now after 30, yeah. 40 years. You mentioned there some of your art, one of your art books, Beauty and the Beast, because you know Doctor Who was far, far from the end of it for, for you, wasn't it? You, you've you've had uh, four, isn't it? Four art book yeah, collections. Yeah, four today. Over the, over the decades. Contributed to quite a few others. You've worked extensively as a conceptual artist as well, haven't you? And interior illustrator. Yes, I have. Yes, and uh, for for movies, you know, I, I was brought in as the last resort, you know, when the costume designer was uh, having their work rejected and the uh, and, and the director was okay. pulling his hair out. <laughs> was this Willow? Was this on Willow? Willow and King Arthur, mainly. Last Resort and Chris Akilay are somehow do not work together in the same sense. <laughs> well, you work. know, it, I, w I always wish that was brought in in the beginning of a project, you know, yeah. rather than on the last minute, you know, when everybody's panicking and, you know. One of your other most famous pieces of work is the is the cover, uh, well, the covers for, for Raven's Swords, Swords Mistress of Chaos, which, of course, Kate Bush um, very famously uh, appropriated for her babushka video. Yes, she did, I mean, <laughs> without asking. Did, I was going to say, did she not ask permission? She, no. she, she did no, ask they did. I'm disappointed because it, because when you look at the two side by side, you look at the at the, at the babushka video and you look at your artwork. It's a direct, direct copy. She didn't ask permission. Well, her team didn't ask permission. There was, you know, it's a long story, but I challenged them with it, and uh, I was told to bugger off, basically, and that made me angry. <laughs> And I said, I get, I've got to get a lawyer onto this and, and sue the pants of them and all this. But I, I never, I, I just got on with my work and, and tried to forget about it. And then I got a call from her brother who was acting as her agent or some position like that. He apologized. He said in, of what happened before. And they sat the person that spoke to me so rudely. And he acknowledges that it was copied from my painting. And uh, and willing to pay me uh, a fee for because they they they're gonna launch uh, Kate Bush's greatest hits and they're gonna have a a vinyl with with a picture of Babushka on it and this and that and uh, and he caught me in a good mood. One minute I'm drawing, working away. The phone goes and then this, you know, you have to put your business hat on, which I never did, and um, I I just mention a figure which was silly and he jumped on it next thing i know is a biker not it's a biker messenger on the doorstep with a check and and, <laughs> and a release form for me to sign a release letter you know terrible i wow. i just said to him no i just want my credit acknowledgement that uh, the truth again I, i'm very strong you know i believe in justice and truth and honor you know and i try to live by it and I've come across a lot of people who do not in this industry, including the the publisher of my first three books, you know, uh, Dragon's World Limited, who was a gangster, you know. He, he was an absolute gangster old man and didn't pay us royalties that he owed and uh, I had to take I had to take legal action against him and basically put him out of business, which also made a lot of other artists very angry with me because they, to quote them, they didn't care as long as they were getting famous, which made me furious to hear that they just wanted to be famous and didn't care that uh, that they were being exploited. Yeah. Well, oh. I, I think you're clearly a man of integrity and, and, and I'll take my hat off to you for that because all credit would... I. I it's much better to be a man with integrity than than, than a, a scoundrel. Yeah. Any and but so, it's always a price to play in this world, you know, because business is business, they say, you know. As if, you know, um, it's all right to do, to break all the rules and exploit people and uh, and just, just carry on as if, you know, nothing matters. 
What advice would you give to any young artists out there that are listening that would want to go into the Oh, uh, and I've been asked that? before, many years I've been asked. Uh, I had uh, young artists coming to me almost in tears saying, I've done this illustration and the, the publisher is now using it for all sorts of things. What can I do about it, Chris? And I say to him, well, show me your, um, your, your invoice. And he said, what invoice? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I oh, said, I don't have one. I just oh. have a, a receipt, you know. Oh, my God. These things you learn as you so go Watch along. your paperwork. That's that's the advice. Get your paperwork yeah. in order. Chris, 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 Chris <laughs> what are your thoughts it. now? Obviously, unfortunately, your kind of style of work now is very gone because it's because it's all it's all digital art now. It's all computer graphics. Oh, yes. Which I, 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 you know, Dan knows I really am not a fan of. I, I, I don't like computers. I don't like computer graphics. This to me, your stuff is the real deal. How do you feel about that? Where do you stand on digital art versus versus what I think of as real art? I think it started, I don't know when this, in the 90s? Did they? Yeah, I would say 90s. Photoshop came along, late 90s. And, uh, you know, I've got friends, artists, and uh, one in particular, he, he went and spent a fortune buying the latest uh, Apple Mac and Photoshop and all this. He mastered it, That's the, you know, the computer art style. And he said to me, you know, I can do it in a fraction of the time, Chris, that it takes to do a painting. And that's what he was about again, money, you know. And publishers got used to paint pittance, really, for covers. You know, why do that when you have an in-house in, an in, an in, an in -house student just out of college you know painting pittance and say get me a cover for this you know and it'll go and copy and paste something you know and call it a cover and why would they want to pay an artist like me a decent fee to spend uh, two weeks to a month you know doing a cover it's just not worth it the problem is computers have allowed everybody to become an artist that that's the yeah. problem so, and so if you haven't learned your craft to begin with, it doesn't matter. You just press a few well, buttons. And you've got a there's a, a lot of people can draw. You know, a lot of kids can really draw well, and amazingly well. But that a lot of people don't have the imagination, first of all, and the sense of, um, of symmetry, you know, and the eye of an artist. You know what I mean? All those things go together uh, to make a successful commercial artist including things like patience and not mind being in a room by yourself for days or weeks, you know, <laughs> with the only company is, is the radio, you know, or your music. And, and the pressure of deadlines, you know, it's another thing. I had a friend who was a great, amazing artist, but could not meet the deadline. <laughs> he just couldn't take the pressure and it, it killed him in the end, you know. He just had to give it up. It's all these things, you know, self-discipline above all, to sit down and, 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 and get on with it instead of playing a computer game or something. Do you still see illustrators that, you know, up-and-coming people? Do, does, do work, does other people's work still catch your eye? And are there still people coming up that um, you admire? Yeah, of course there are. They're amazing artists, um, mostly digital. They are digital, but they're... they're you know, the digital format is really made for reproduction on, on, on book covers and comic strips, especially. It's fantastic, the, the quality you get now. But it's not, they have nothing to show. There's no artwork. And, and I would say this, there's no risk in computer art, in digital art. Well, in, in, if you're doing a painting, as you know, if you did yourself, I mean, look at the Loch Ness Monster. If I got, you know, the airbrushing of the of, of the rainbow colors in the back of that, imagine if, you know, I'm doing all that, and suddenly the airbrush spits or, or, the, or, the, or the masking comes loose, yeah. you know. You've oh, got yeah. no undo yeah. button. Yeah, that was so <laughs> difficult to do. Not many people could have done that in those days. You can do that digitally, no problem at all. You yeah. make a mistake, you go back a step, you know. And you've, not, and you've knocked that up in literally about five minutes, the, 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 the background on that, on a, on a computer. 
and, exactly. and it's funny it, it's funny you mention that because that one again is one of the ones that, that that always intrigued me as a child i used to think what what made the artist put that in in this colored tunnel what was the idea again it's very it's very it's got nothing really to do with the story where, where did the inspiration come from to do that well it's thinking it's almost like a time tunnel isn't it it's sort of the doctor in the middle of it and like I, when i did patrick trout in a web you know um in, like a, a spider in the middle of the web you know it's sort of the main thing you know it, it's just what you said about the tv the tv screen earlier on i did wonder if it was you know that when the tv when the tv goes off it used to go to the little yeah. white dot i did wonder if it was there, if it was another tv sort of visual metaphor yeah. this, almost. Is, this is one of, the, one of the reasons why these covers are so successful because again as a child i looked at that and i was intrigued by it and i was drawn into the tunnel and so it was far more than just a piece of artwork with the saigon and a lot less monster on it. Yeah. it it had again it had a world in there that i could it literally did. fall into and yeah. explore. Do you? I mean, we talked about your favourite cover. Do, I dare to ask. Do you have a least favourite cover, Chris? I have a few. Oh, you've got a few. <laughs> How can you have a few? <laughs> I have Go a on. few. I'm do you want to know? Give yeah, I do. I'm intrigued because these all are just such brilliant pieces of artwork, and I'd have every oh. one of them on my wall. Please. Okay, you ready for this? The seeds yeah, of doom. No, it's one it's of all... the best. It's a movie in itself. It's on yeah. my wall. Look, it's on my yeah. wall. I know. What's I know. wrong with it? The the figures that Tom Tom Baker and what's the name? They're awful. They're just, no, they're wonderful. They're drawn I, so badly. The only no, thing, I remember. The only good thing is the explosion. I love the explosion. <laughs> the explosion is magnificent. The explosion. Isn't it good? The it's best, is brilliant. I just love that. The, 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 the fact that you've got a Spitfire little whatever it is in there and RA. No. Oh. That's, um, that's um, oh, God, what do you call that plane? I used to know backwards. What, am, I, what is it, Harry? I don't know what it is. No, 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 no. Not, not Phantom. A, Phantom. Phantom. A Phantom. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, there's a movie in that, Chris. There is a movie in that. What? Well, no, the design <laughs> is cool. It tells the story, but the drawing of the figures, especially Sarah's mouth open like that, it just looks awful. The niggles he's got with it, Simon Niggles. Yeah, come on, have another one then. Another one? Yeah. Um, Another one, let me think. Um, It's uh, the demons. Oh, okay. The demons and the doomsday weapon. Interesting. Why don't we? Oh, you see, I love the doomsday weapon because of the claws. Yeah, I really yeah, I got the I got the colours wrong in the Doomsday Weapon. Oh, I, I lo- you know, again, the design is good. The master looks good. The doctor looks good. We and go. the design of the claws and it's just the colour is awful. The background covers colours are, are dreadful. The more lo- it's more lurid than you know, yeah, I yeah. It's just a mess. It's a no, splodge, I, it's I, love, I, love, I love the colours on that. That, that, that that's, that's the line it. work that's is so beautiful. Mind. I've never even that's noticed. That's my mind <laughs> reeling as a child. I'm kind of. I might go with you on the demons. Actually, I'm. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the deep in the new light now, and I'm thinking you might have a point on the demon. Yeah, don't like it. They can't all be number one. Something's got to finish bottom, hasn't it? Even even in a, a distinguished lion as that. Have you got Have you got a couple of favourites? Uh, my favourites, I would definitely say. Uh, well, my absolute top favourite, without any shadow of a doubt, is. Darling- Let's give me give me da- give well, top three. Well, well, my top oh. one. I'm going for my top one, which is the Dalek oh. Invasion of Earth. Really? Uh, that was that was the very first. A target book I bought. Yeah, I that was that my. Very, I'd read some from the library, but that was the first target book I bought, and I bought it purely because of the cover. I was presented, it was in WH Smith's, I'd got all these Doctor Who books in front of me, I'd got enough pocket money to buy one of them, which one did I buy? And it (laughs) was that one, purely because of the cover. Now that, Chris, has got to be one of the best work covers of all time. Talk more specifically. We've talked about movies that you love. I love Mm. movies as well. I'm obsessed with movies the same as you. And so there's a movie in there for me. But the Dalek, I love the fact that the Dalek is pink uh, (laughs) rather than what you would expect it to be. Again, I love the the, the death ray coming out of the the arm. The gun. I love the spaceship. I love the explode, the the, the fire at the bottom of it. I love the blitz. It looks like the blitz, doesn't it? Yeah, the skyline with Big Ben in there. 
You can smell the, it. All of the spaceships disappearing off into the distance. I love, again, the fizzy energy that's around the Dalek. Just everything about that is just utter, utter... The guy with the, with the gun... Yeah, they're fantastic. And of course, what's interesting is that you've used the, the the photographic reference that you've used from this is not actually from the TV show; it's from yeah. the Dalek movie. And yeah. so, you know, you you made the right decision. I did, was that a <laughs> deliberate decision to go for the movie Spaceship and Robo Man? No, no, I, I probably didn't have enough reference for for the TV show, and. Well, uh, I, well, thank, I, I, well, thank goodness, because it's a blessed relief, because that Robo Man and that spaceship is way better than anything that would have uh, <laughs> from the yeah. TV show. And well, recently, just... more recently, I, I do private commissions for people, mm -hmm. and uh, I did one. Was it a private commission? I get confused because I did some covers for the FedEx magazine when they when the um, the series was relaunched. The TV series was relaunched. They asked me. They did a big oh, article yes, on it. Effects, yeah. Okay. And and yeah, and I did a Christopher Eccleton, the Rose yeah. story. Yes. But later on, uh, they asked me to do three pictures, three paintings. Yeah, and they did. Yeah. So um, I can't remember if it was one of them or not. But I chose to do it again and be faithful to the TV show this time. Okay. And, um, and you know what? It's it. You know, I sell these prints. It's one of the best sellers, you know. Yes. But I can't remember if it was from the FedEx. Let's get this clear. I can't remember if it was from FedEx magazine or a private commission. Right. Yeah? yeah, but I have done it. And it's like almost black and white and it's atmospheric yes. of the early 60s, you know. Yes. And we'll make sure that everything we talk about and links to all these various domains and your website, yeah. they'll all be in the show notes. So people can, people listening can go and find your work and can go and order Great. from your shop as well. We'll talk a little bit about that about that in a yeah. moment. So do you have a favourite then, Dan? We've... Yeah. Well, 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 well. Funnily enough, uh, we've mentioned a fair few of them, but I think if I was to if I was to land on a couple, well, this one, funnily enough, would, would be coming up on the inside lane. I've always loved the claws of access, ah, funnily enough. Yeah, there Chris, you go. I've always adored that i didn't see the story for years years after i read it and i read this one over and over again the story and the the childlike sort of figure of the axon alien which is everything that you get in the story to be fair to the production to, uh, production team at the time but i think you stylize it just that little bit to to sell the story that bit more and, and to and it's just got a sense of a sense of scale and of um, of something that's yeah almost filmized again, but certainly more drama. I think with those beams coming out yeah. of the uh, the axon, that was risky doing that. the axon child's eyes. That was very risky because I finished risky. the painting. I was looking at looking at and say it needs something else. You know, I, I don't. I, I feel it, yeah. instinctively these things. I took yeah. a chance and did the rays coming out of his eyes sideways like that, which obliterated the. Uh, uh, a big part of the of the creature behind. You lose some yeah. image area behind, don't you? So I could, I could see that was probably a bit of a gamble. But I think if I've got a favourite one, if I have to land okay. on a favourite, it's probably this one. If you're talking about something that stands out on on the shelf, it's ah. the Carnival of Monsters. There, <laughs> okay. I love that sort of look of disdain on the Doctor's <laughs> face, as if to say, a, a sea monster. Yeah. A sea monster's got nothing on me yeah. on the Carnival of Monsters. And I know that people love the invasion of the dinosaurs. That's a very iconic cover for you, isn't it, with the big clack letters and the yeah. pterodactyl. But I prefer this one. I, I love the open mouth there of the sea creature yeah. and and the ship. The de I think it's the detail that you were speaking of earlier on, Chris. I think all, all those leanings you know, Dan, come in and the foam that's coming out of the mouth. Yeah. Yes. You know, Dan, I actually went and uh, I've got a couple of really good beautiful books on ships, the history of ships. And uh, I actually looked up, the story was in, based in the 1930s, I believe. Yes. The, the, the ship was from the 1930s. So yeah. I actually went and looked up what uh, cargo ships looked like in the 1930s and made sure that I got a cargo ship from the 1930s there. <laughs> and again, and again, it's far better it's, than the television program. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the way they do that in the TV show is, is yeah. very, very poor compared with with art. And I think they got the 
They did, yeah. And I think they got the house dress right there with the yellow trim with yeah. the green logo. But it, it's so strange that I've picked, like, out of my top three, two of them are Pertwee stories, when per- the Pertwee era is my least favourite on the telly. Yeah. So, so that tells yeah, you yeah, something, something basically, Something about these, these covers. It really does. I, th- I think that the, the detail on, on John's face. Yeah, there, John Pertwee is it's one of the best yes. drawings of him there, yeah. He looks haughty. The other one he? I've just got to mention, because this <laughs> yes. is a very, very close second for me, is Pyramids of Mars. That is a stunning piece of artwork. The, 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 again, the rendering on the Doctor and Sarah and, and the Mummy are just... And again, it's just a really unusual colour for the background. And I love the deep purple that they chose for the logo. And again, I remember yeah. it's a child just literally um, obsessing, sitting and obsessing over that cover. But it's an again, it's an unusual design. I mean... What came up with that design? You know, every time I had to do a painting, a cover, I would take the previous covers I've done and put them next to me. <laughs> and I would look at those and I say, you know, and it's a scary time, you know, doing covers, painting pictures like that, to be approved by art director and then a publisher and all this, you know, with deadlines. It's scary business. That's why a lot of people can't take the pressure. It's like the writer staring at the blank page. It's the same with an artist staring at the blank board, you know. And every time I did a Doctor Who, I have to come up with something different, but the same, you know, if you know what I mean. Yes. You know. <laughs> so I will put the others next to it. And, and uh, first of all, take courage that I've done that. So I've done those, so I can do another one, you know. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, uh, not to repeat exactly the same design as I did before. Come up with something that's different. And it's funny yeah. because because you saying that you would lay them out next to each other to see what they've done. Well, this is something again Dan and I have talked about, and a lot of Doc Two fans will say the same thing that when they used to get a new Target book, they would go home and they'd lay all of their Target books out on the floor next to each other just to look at all of those glorious covers in one. I hear of- this such a lot. <laughs> we all did just looking at them and 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 as I say, obsessing over them. These were it's mm. it is difficult to to express this. If you weren't there, it's difficult to express. But for people yeah. who were there at the time, and these were such a lifeline for people yeah. like me who was geeky and just sat in his room the whole time and didn't really have any mates. And so uh-huh. I, I I obsessed over these, and and it's so it's difficult to to try to get across quite how important this artwork was. I was uh, oblivion to all that. Do you think you would have done anything differently? Had you know, we're looking back 30, 40 years now. More than that. You had no idea that they were going to be uh, obsessed about quite as much as they are. Would you have done anything differently, do you think? No, I don't think so. don't think so. It's the way I worked at the time. I mean, I, I've just finished four new ones for the book, for the new book. Whoa, now that's very exciting. Four new Chris Achilleos artworks. Yes, from four different stories that I haven't done before. Can you give and us any, any insights as to what those are? Or, or no, are no, 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 no. <laughs> now this, this, is for, this is for your new book, isn't it? It's called yeah. Clack, the Doctor Who art of, of Chris Achilleos. And it collects the, the entirety, doesn't it, of your Doctor Who output, as we said earlier, yeah. earlier on, in chronological order and with commentary from yeah. your good self as well as some of your fans doesn't it the, the definitive guide to all of your yes. work all the, to your say that we're to excited us. would be an absolute understatement I mean you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're champing at the bit we're waiting for this book to arrive oh, thank you what, what can you tell us about the book how did it come about can you tell us that well I always wanted to do one because people kept asking me you know um, why don't you do a book you know with all the Doctor Who's and all this and uh, or not just a book, but merchandise and all sorts, T-shirts, you know, and all this. I, I never did, you know, because um, I don't know. I was too busy on other things, you know. I've, I've never been a money-conscious guy, you know. You know, I've been doing conventions a lot in here in America and Europe. I was in a convention, and uh, the publisher was there, which is uh, thank Candy you, jar. thank you. He was there. We talked for a bit, and I quite liked him. Sean was a very nice guy. And uh, he put the idea to me of a book, and we discussed it. And uh, we came to a, a reasonable deal about it. 
and we enthused about the context and what we can do. And uh, the more we talked about it, the more excited we got. And uh, so in the end, we, we sat down and uh, wrote out a, an agreement of some sort. And uh, and that's the story, you know, that's how... And well, we're the more you it. talk about it, the more excited we get, because seriously, the thought of four new paintings, from, well, the pieces of artwork from you is just, well... Yeah, I mean, that's part of the... Uh, it was my idea. I said, um, if we're doing a book, then we have to show something that's exclusive but not been seen before. Are, are they all still in your in your classic sort of style and still done by hand? Is there any yes, yes, of course. No, they're done uh, exactly the same way. Uh, I try to find the the right tools as well. I, I still use the airbrush and the pen, you know, and all that. It, it's difficult to find the illustration board because they're all gone out of production because people use digital now. They don't use boards for real painting and drawing. Uh, they're very hard to find, so the best boards are gone. Luckily, I've still got a few left. But I chose to do, I said I like to do four new ones, but I wanted to do the first four doctors that I used to draw. Oh, how excited so, are we? Yeah. Yeah, so, nice. so I chose a story from um, from each of them that I haven't done before and uh, did that. We'll have to see if we can try and get. We're going to go and guess later on, Chris. The pair, the pair of us will be comparing <laughs> we'll notes. The list and, and when and this we're working book out released. which one it might yeah, be. We'll, <laughs> we're not going to bet on it. You're okay. But the, uh, Clack is coming out in both paperback and hardback. Yes. Isn't it? Um, we said we'd do a special edition hardback. We'll have extra things on that. And uh, I mean, we discuss all sorts of crazy ideas, you know, how to make it special. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't want to talk about it too much in case no, I get no. something. Way that no, we'll, 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 we'll keep it for another day. We'll keep it for for another day once once the book is out and we can take a proper. Yeah, look. we'll do that. We'll, we'll yeah. do that. But rest assured, there will be links to Candy Jar books where you can pre-order this title. They'll be in the show notes That'd be too. Good. If we, if we can, on, I mean, you touched on merchandising before. Yeah, I was about to get round to that because a visit to your website. Wow. <laughs> You really have. You found a way, haven't you? To these pieces of graphic art that we were mm. talking about earlier on, like all great pieces of graphic yeah. art, be they like al- album covers or, or whatever else, all the all these things that sort of stand the test of time, and that nostalgia is always so strong for. You have managed to give new life to so many yeah. of, your, of your artworks by doing these really creative things with them i mean it's not it's not uh, reinventing the wheel is it putting art on mugs but the art of this detail and this mm-hmm. beauty uh, and associated so clearly with one product translating it to another altogether and now we can drink out of your wonderful <laughs> design work so yes where, was this your idea well what mugs? happened was that uh, a fan sent me a link to a site on a website that was selling mugs and t-shirts from my designs and uh i was very angry at that i I again you know like the kate bush thing i sort of tried to forget about it and then it happened again with someone else selling mugs and t-shirts so this time i i contacted my contacted the bbc books and told them about it and the right person came on the right guy and he he managed to take the site down. I was told. Good. But I told this to friends who are Doctor Who fans, and they said, "Chris, if you don't do it, you should know. If you don't do it, someone else will." So people want this stuff up there. So if you don't want pirates doing it, do it your bloody self, you know. <laughs> and, got, a, got a point. And I said, "Well, I love to do it, but I don't know how to do digital art, and it has to be done digitally now, yeah. you know." The designing because I'm not just reproducing the painting on the mug, it just will look nonsense like this at Pirates did, you know. I said, I want to do it. You're, you've adapted the design, I need to you? design it around the object, and I can do it on paper, sure, I can draw the layout and everything, and then ask the printers to do it like the old fashioned ways. But this is mugs, you know, yeah. And I was rather stuck with that, and until the powers in the clouds up there send me a contact. <laughs> which I could work with and uh, his name is Mark and he's fantastic artist in his own right but we work together so well at this and he's able to to work from my designs and execute them in a digital way uh, on the mugs so it, it's wonderful to work 
together with someone like that who who's sensitive to my design sense and all that. First, I did one to see what it looked like. I did the Zabi. I managed to sort of alter it so it goes round the mug. But then I realized, yeah, that works well. But then when I came to do another one, I realized there isn't really another one that I from all the collection that I could I could uh, alter or in any way to go round the mug. I made a decision to use two images, two covers, if you like, on one mug, and it works well. And I mean, they are things of, of utter beauty. And Dan and I talked about these two or three weeks oh. ago when they first then, came on the market. Yeah. Every, suddenly, it was it was odd. They were nowhere, and then suddenly, everybody suddenly started saying, "Have you seen the new Chris Achilles mugs?" Well, we fell in love with them straight away. They're just beautiful. I mean, look at the Dalek invasion of Earth. And your favourites are there, the Chris of the Demons and the <laughs> DJ Weapon. Oh. They're all available to order upon upon Chris Achilles' yeah. website. Well, I, I'm still doing them. I mean, we did a few and then uh, put them on eBay. Not on eBay, on Facebook. God, we got such a response, you know. Oh, we want them, we want them, we want them. Yeah. So we put them on the website and straight away we're getting orders. So I said, yeah. oh, well, I better carry on doing some more then. So I just threw the images together without thinking what story goes with what and all this, you know. I, I didn't, so I would put a, a, a Tom Baker with a Pertwee, you know. I, I, I just did them as I went along. I think you will find that, that, that basically every Doctor Who fan loves every one of your covers. Good. They, they're going to make for striking additions to the average kitchen if people are going to insist on drinking well, out of them and... Well, I know. certainly will. I haven't got round to getting one yet. I'm still on my mug, but, but Dan knows that I just literally survive on tea and coffee, so I have to get them. <laughs> I can only imagine where your where your designs will oh. turn up next, Chris. Well, we, we underpants, t-shirts. maybe? We definitely need T-shirts. More. T- yeah. T-shirts and underpants. Yeah. Well, yes, I've done, yes, so far, there's um, 12 or 14 on the website. The last one to do was the most difficult one. Because it was on its own, it left on its own because it's an odd one, and it's the uh, the Crusades. Okay. Uh, I know it's not a popular story. I don't know why it is, but it's not um, a favourite for a lot of people. I put it together with the Zabi. Oh, that works brilliantly. That works perfectly with the Zabi, I would say. Well, I'm using the Zabi design, which I did the first month with the prototype. Mm-hmm. And I'm putting it together with with the Crusades, and we see what happens. And that's well, again, the last one that will be up. Well, again, I mean, they're beautiful. Well, the Zabi in particular is 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 probably the best rendition of of William Hartnell that anybody's ever done. I mean, it's just beautiful. That is. So those two together, I would say, are a perfect match. For anybody else that is interested in this stuff, um, also you will find on Chris's website um, that you can buy prints for just about any of the, I think there's a couple of, of your covers that are, that are not available as prints, but pretty much every one of your covers and various pieces of artwork are available as prints and, and, and they're magnificent. I mean, I've got some of them on my wall now. So so go and have a look at Chris, Chris's website because you will want to get your credit card out. It's. I still have some originals. <laughs> Not from the old ones, because I sold them a long time ago for nothing, you know, and now they're worth a lot of money. But for the new ones I've been doing, for the SFX magazine and the, uh, and the four new ones I've just done, they'll all be available for sale. If everybody, anybody's interested, uh, just uh, contact me through my website. Well, make sure people know exactly where to find you and to see all your all your wares. All this, it's a great mix, isn't it, Simon, of the sort of nostalgia that we, we regularly bathe in on this show. <laughs> but the promise of new sights and new spectacles and all this new energy and, and flavour in, in that unmistakable style of yours that, that really has captivated people's imaginations. Successive fans, they keep rediscovering a love of these books. You know, people still collect them, Chris. Even though we've got new ones coming out, we know people are actively seeking the old books on eBay, and and, and sort of they get the collecting bu- bug really quite quickly. And make no mistake, a great deal of it is down to the appeal, the, the timeless appeal of your artwork and your designs. And, and I notice even the BBC themselves, because of course they're putting out new books all the time, they're doing their very best as well sometimes <laughs> to sort of capture your distinctive 
way with the show and, and, and that sort of visual language of yours, which you know I, I don't know how flattering that is for you or whether it's frustrating or not. Why can't why can't they give you the commission? I'm not entirely oh, sure. But <laughs> I get so many people asking me the question. What what? Why don't you do the covers anymore, Chris? You know, and I say, well, it's not up to me, <laughs> up to the BBC to uh, contact me the, and ask me. Oh, they know where to find you, and we'll we'll make sure we get this. Well, the thing is, right I did three, places, didn't I? I did three. Yeah. They asked me to do three. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how many years ago now. Is it three or four years? Ago? Well, I would say it's about three. Three, yeah, three years it ago. It seems to coincide with the um, with the exhibition of the target artwork that was at the uh, the cartoon. In, in London, I think they were around about that time. Before that, was before it? that, that was the Visitation, Vengeance on Varos, and Battlefield. Yeah, I, I was I was delighted to hear from them that they wanted me to do do new covers, and I imagine doing you know carrying on where I left off. And they but absolutely me, are carrying on as as you left off. Well, I, in a way, but um, I was disappointed when they told me that it was the the eighties doctors. I, you know, I, I really didn't like the show in the 80s at all. I stopped watching it and uh, I just moved to other things. And I think the formula of having uh, the older doctor. So uh, now you can, with this new, but this new book of yours, you get to choose which stories you get to choose. your. Yeah, I did. I did four of the nice. old ones. Nice. And um, so I wasn't in sympathy with the three doctors. At the, so the covers I did for those three, I don't think they're of the quality that I used to do the the original ones on. And that was and that was because you didn't feel such a connection with the show. No, I didn't feel connected with the show or or the um, the whole thing, you know. But uh, I was committed, so I did them. But you know, if I was to be asked again, I I would do either the very new ones, or the very old ones. <laughs> so you do Jodie Whittaker, would you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Well, bring us bring us up to up to date. We're in twenty twenty now, and you know you, took, you talked about your love of your love of cinema and of TV and of all that sort of thing. Do, you know, do you still love the movies yeah. now? And which movies catch your eye? Do you still watch science fiction now? And do you still watch Doctor Who? And would you would you paint the latest few Doctors? How do you um, feel about all that? I would love to do um, Capaldi. I think he made, he made a very good Doctor. And the two before him, uh, remind me their names. David Tennant, yeah, and Matt David Smith. Tennant, and especially and Matt Smith, because they have very unusual faces and all this, you know. And and there's all sorts of references now for them, uh, and the stories, think, you know. Yeah. Um, Peter Capaldi in particular, I think you would do yeah. Peter Capaldi very well because of that dot style in the same style that you you, you were talking about Patrick Troughton earlier. Yeah, yeah, I could do him justice. Um, very easily, you know, I could do that. Do you still watch the show? Do you catch um, the show? And I taped them, but I haven't watched them. I watched two episodes or three episodes of the one with the, the Lady Doctor. I'm afraid <laughs> the BBC is not her fault. It's not the actress' fault. It's not uh, anybody's fault. It's just that it, it just does not suit, you know, having a, a doctor. We're very much of that and, opinion here. Too, more, than well, that, more than that, Dan, I think it's just purely PC and political. You know, the formula is too PC. They're always preaching, you know, about this or about that in the messages of the stories. And even the the team, you know, the, the, the companions, you know, and the doctor, it's all politically chosen, do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I just hate what it's become. How do you feel about the big screen then? Do you still go to the cinema? Do you still love all that? Or do, or do you always tend to gravitate back towards the old movies and the classics like Spartacus and whatever else? Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, I love the movies. I love film. And I go and see great movies, you know, when they're there. I love going to the cinema. Yeah. But recently, you know, I can't remember the last film I've seen. You know, my love is doing... is historical epics you know and until yeah. until um game of thrones was done for tv it showed what can be done with historical fantasy there's been a dearth of that at the cinema hasn't there since lord of the rings i think it is time 
I also think Lord of the Rings and Gladiator, all those films, you know, twenty years ago. Oh uh, yes, I mean, I haven't really gone back there. I, I think yeah, right. I mean, Gladiator had it was a great movie. I went to see it at the pictures because Ridley Scott and uh, who did Alien and those fabulous movies, uh, and he's a great director. I liked it, but it's also I didn't like aspects of it. It was it wasn't historical. It was a uh, comic strip, if you like, you know. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, it was fantastic, and and uh, and all that but i was so happy that someone is um tackling doing a historical epic if you like because and, nobody and, would touch it for so long you know because it costs so much and they lose you know the gambles yeah you know and and lord of the rings when that came out and, and even star wars you know when that came out i think it was 77 uh, we i say we the artists prepared the way to Star Wars be made and the success of it and other fantasy movies Absolutely. that came after that. Because we were doing it on the covers of paper bags and on album sleeves and on posters and things. People were, young people especially, were starving for fantasy. And when it was taken off... There is a definite line, there's, there's a definite line through from the late 60s through to the late mm. 70s where all of that stuff was coming through, through through prog rock on album covers, as yeah. you said, through through fantasy artwork. There is a definite line you can track leading up yes. to Star Wars, isn't there? And yes, and it wasn't. It was only done on, 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 by artists on, on paper, you know, on, on yeah. covers and that. Because the attempts were made to put it on the big screen they didn't have CGI, so it didn't work. It just looked comical, you know. Um, and, I, and I've got to ask you about this because because it, you mentioned Ridley Scott. He's one of my favourite film directors, and Blade Runner is my all-time favourite film. And I read yeah. something, I don't know whether this is correct, that you've done at some point, um, you possibly almost been involved in doing a poster for Blade Runner at some point? I, I was, in the 80s, I, I stopped doing book covers, mainly because... Um, Oh, this is so weird to explain to someone, to make them understand. As soon as the film industry started doing films, the publishing thing died a death. Uh, I don't know why. What they were doing through the 60s and 70s, they were rehashing old books, old fantasy stories that had been written in the 30s and 40s and, and, and all that time, and re them with temporary fantasy art that I was doing and other artists were doing and selling them on the strength of the covers basically because they were a big success they were bringing out all this other stuff that was really bad pulp fiction if any and putting fantasy art on them selling them on the strength of the covers and so people stopped buying them if you like as soon as films started coming out like Star Wars they abandoned the fantasy thing, mainly because publishers abandoned it first, and then went to the to the screen instead. And when he came to, and when he came to um, to Ridley Scott and and Blade Runner, I was approached by Warner Brothers, direct by Warner Brothers, not an agency or anything, but by Warner Brothers, to work on some concepts for a poster, or some films. Like Greystoke was the first one. There, they gave me Supergirl. And then, well, a few others I won't go into. I can't remember them. And I was doing all Batman, the first Batman movie. And then uh, they said, there's this movie by Ridley Scott who did, who did Alien. And it's called Blade Runner. And we'd like you to do the poster, Chris. And get this. They asked me to go down to, to Wardour Street, to Warner Brothers offices, where they have a private theater downstairs to, to watch Blade Runner. And I watched Blade Runner by myself, and I was like, can you imagine the, the overload of, of visual, you know, yeah. the yeah. whole thing? And the lights come on, and I walk upstairs, and there's Ridley Scott upstairs in the office with his wife and the head of Warner Brothers, Julian Senior. And they say to me, what did you think? <laughs> and I said, oh my God. I said, I don't know if it's right or wrong what I said, but I said, this is an amazing movie, but I have to see it again. And I said, it's just too good. He said, if you're looking for another success of Star Wars, which is everybody was looking for, it's not that. I said, this would be more of a cult movie. And I was proven to be dead right on that. Yes, absolutely. 
And I said, it's a cult movie. But I said, I want to ask you, how do you want to sell it on the poster? What do you want me to do? And they sort of laughed. And uh, I don't know who said it, but they said, we want you to come up with, an, with, with, with your own concept, Chris. And I thought for a minute, I said, well, it's a sort of sci-fi movie. Do you want it to look like sci-fi? And they said, no, no, not at all. We don't want it to look like sci-fi. And I said, well, okay, how do you, it's a bit film noir. How about film noir kind of approach? And he said, no, no film noir either. Come up with something different. <laughs> so I was left with that. And the thing they, they told me later was, that there was already a poster done because it was, it was released in America, but it bombed. Can you believe yeah. this? Blade Runner bombed. <laughs> I know, it's incredible to think about, isn't it? But it did. Yeah. And they blamed it on the poster that was done poster. because it was science fiction. There was a movement there, anti-science fiction movies. This is what Ridley Scott and oh. the head of Warner Brothers told me. So they didn't want it to look like science fiction. So uh, they wanted a new poster for the European theatre. So I went and did my thing and uh, did two full colour roughs and uh, four other black and whites and, and showed it to unveil them to Julian Senior, the head of Warner Brothers UK, European. There was this lady there i never seen before. Julian said, this is uh, so-and-so from the lad distributor. They are the distributors of the movie. The lad company. Have you heard of the lad company? Yeah, they made the Pla Planet yeah. of the Apes films, yeah. didn't they? Um, I think she was the daughter of Alan Ladd. Alan Ladd, yeah. And uh, so I unveiled my pictures. And Julian absolutely loved the one that I loved, that I wanted to do. And he went straight for that. And I, was so, I said, that's fabulous because that's the one I prefer also. And, and she was silent and he says to her, what do you think? And she said, well, it's all right, but where are all the other actors? I said, what? What other actors? And she said, well, where's, you know, the, the, the guy with the dog, what's his name, the actor? I can't pronounce it. Yeah, where is he? And she said, well, we have to have him in the poster because they're the stars. And they have, we have contractual obligation to do so. And I went, what? Why wasn't I told this? Absolutely. I said, well, we can put the photos, uh, you know, fit them underneath. She said, no, no, that won't do. And Julian hit the roof. He started swearing. Use the, use the old poster <laughs> that you rejected in the first place. And that was that. I got oh. paid for the work I did, but I didn't do the poster for Blade Runner. Oh. And if you go on my website, you see that people loved it. I sold the original painting and I sell prints like all the time of that. I haven't seen that. I can't believe I haven't found that on your website. I will go and look for it now. Get over there. We'll, we'll all be over on the yeah. uh, on the website later on looking at that for certain. Cause I the website, yeah, the, the, the film <laughs> section is interesting. It's not all there. We can't thank you enough for sharing these these stories and, yeah. and these chapters of your life with us this time. It, it it's really it's sincerely been a dream come true for Simon and myself. That's that's no exaggeration, it's no Simon. Whatsoever, <laughs> I, I, Chris is absolutely one of my heroes. I know he is one of yours, Dan. Um, both as a Doctor Who fan and yeah. also as, as 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 somebody who loves graphic art and has and has dabbled and, and worked in graphic art myself. So you are absolutely a hero, and so to have sat here and just talked at the end, honestly, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope you've enjoyed it just half as much as we've enjoyed it, because it's well, been fantastic. It's always nice to go back on old memories, you know. I'm getting on now, so when I talk about those days, you know, I, I, I can't help thinking of, of that young man with a head full of hair and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's full of enthusiasm and working from cover to cover, you know, working so hard. I mean, I don't know how I did it because I had to read the book so they come up with an idea and execute it and deliver it in time. And that's, oh, my God, you know, I hate to be doing that now. It's just, it's, yeah, <laughs> very proud of, of, of that young man. Now, we're going to remind people 
where your website is, where they can find the book, where they can buy mugs Thank or you. prints or whatever else that tickles their fancy off the back of this conversation because it's an exclusive range of merchandise, merchandise, official range of merchandise of this classic Doctor Who artwork, www.chrisakileos.co.uk and there'll be links in the show notes and tweeted out and all the rest of it. Once again, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dan and Simon. It's been really good. Like I said, it, I enjoyed myself and I look forward to uh, speaking again. We'll speak to you again once that book's that out. Be fantastic. Yeah. What a guy. What a show. Still can't quite believe that was us. We got to talk to Chris <laughs> it, it, it's, it's absolutely a, a dream come true. You know, for me personally, I, I'm, it's safe to say I'm obsessed by Target books. Um, they were an enormous part of my childhood. And so literally just to sit down with a legend like Chris and just talk about the minutiae of some of these covers, you know, why he made some of the decisions he made to put some of these things on there. It's just pretty, I, I obsessed over these as a kid to just sit and talk about some of these little tiny details. It just doesn't get any more exciting and geeky than that for me. I think my life's complete. That's definitely a bucket list done for me. This is the equivalent, isn't it? If we go back to our schoolboy analogy, this is the equivalent of at the end of sports day or at the end of a, of a really rigorous sort of PE session, this is being sparked out, doing the star-shaped on a grassy embankment, <laughs> covered in sweat, totally spent, but completely sort of satisfied that you got it out of your system. Ooh. I could go back, in fact, I probably will go straight back to the loft, get that box out and yeah, dive right in again because there are so many covers that, that you mentioned and that Chris mentioned that you know I haven't gazed at in a while I want to go and look back on all those little tiny details and of course order this brand new book it sounds it sounds not long awaited isn't isn't quite the right expression it sounds long overdue doesn't it it does sound very very long overdue and 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 Chris is definitely coming in now doing the mugs he's he's getting more prints out there he's he's thinking about t-shirts so I think he's finally realizing his legacy that needs to be got out to people. People are interested in this uh, and they want to see this stuff. And certainly it just makes me want to go and buy more prints, more <laughs> mugs. I just I just love it. And, and what a lovely bloke as well. He was just such a charming, charming, lovely guy, very self-effacing, very humble uh, about the legacy that he's got behind him. Just couldn't be a nicer, nicer bloke to meet. And when everything does return to normal and conventions, hopefully the convention circuit is back to normal, people will get the chance to go and, miss and meet Chris Akaleos and buy some of his brand new merchandise from him at various cons or maybe take along things to sign or whatever because he is, he's ubiquitous, he, he still travels quite a lot doesn't he so there's still plenty of opportunities to meet this man in person and to tell him how much you appreciate all his work too just like we did. Oh yes, how on earth do we follow that? <laughs> You can find out if you listen and look out for the next Type 40. You can find that wherever you found this on Apple Podcasts, for example. We're all over that. Or iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, or Spotify. And don't forget, over on YouTube, you can stream Type 40 on the Fandom Podcast Network's YouTube channel. Yes, as ever, get in touch with us through our social medias, Instagram and Twitter at Type 40 Doctor Who. Or you can email us, Type 40 Doctor Who at gmail.com. Or if you're feeling really, really brave and fancy some real time, who talk? Step into the Type 40 Facebook group. You can find that by just putting our name, Type 40, into the search field on Facebook and find me. I'm scattered through all of space and time, but mostly on Twitter and Instagram as the Spacebook, where I ramble and post about whatever catches my eye, imagination, or both in popular culture. Simon. It's been an absolute pleasure, Dan. I wouldn't have missed this one for the world. And there's links to all our contacts in the show notes, too. Much gratitude and many thanks again to our guest, Chris Akeleos, and thanks to you for listening. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast is a space book production for the fabulous fandom podcast network and we'll always have the time if you have the space.
Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, is a space book production for the Fandom Podcast Network with music by Problem Being.